I'm very excited about today's show. And I'm, do I say that every show? Anyway, but this show is very special to me because our guest is an English farmer who's written a couple of books that are so riveting that I've been literally reading them over and over. The most recent book is Pastoral Song, A Farmer's Journey, and it tells the story firsthand of the promise of industrial agriculture, its disastrous results on this family farm, and the return to a lot of traditional methods while still staying in the modern world. And it tells all of this in a way that's so beautiful and so vivid that you feel like you can see and feel and even smell the land. And these books have become bestsellers, which is also pretty great for books on agriculture. So we'll be talking to James Rebanks in a moment, right after these little announcements. Calling all aspiring ranchers and farmers. Are you looking for an opportunity to get your hands dirty? Kivira Coalition's new agrarian program pairs experienced farmers and ranchers with new agrarians for an immersive eight-month apprenticeship in regenerative agriculture. Apprentices live on site and learn the ins and outs of the operation through full-time employment with access to resources and support from the Kivira Coalition. Mentor ranchers and farmers are passionate about teaching the next generation practical skills to manage an enterprise, but also provide mentorship on topics such as soil health, animal welfare, business profitability, and regenerative land management. Applications will open on November 1st. You can find more information and apply at kiviracoalition.org slash newagrarian. And registration for Regenerate 2021 is now open. This year's conference will be on November 3rd and 4th at Old Town Farm in Albuquerque. The Kivira Coalition, Holistic Management International, and the American Grass-Fed Association will continue their collaboration to convene ranchers, farmers, and land stewards for a hybrid in-person and virtual conference that explores the ideas of weaving water, land, and people. What does regenerative agriculture and land stewardship look like when water is scarce? How can regenerative agriculture regenerate and restore landscapes? How do we shift from a culture of appropriation and destruction of traditional agricultural knowledge to one of recognizing and actively centering the leadership of traditional and BIPOC land stewards? This year's conference consists of several ways to participate. There are field days at amazing operations across the country. Some that are still coming up are the Lazy M Ranch in Angel Fire, New Mexico, the Regen Ranch in Oakwood, Texas, Rain Shadow Organics in Sisters, Oregon, and a discussion on Ogallala Aquifer Regeneration in Hereford, Texas. And there's a week of about 30 virtual workshops, October 25th through 29th, and plenary and round table sessions held both virtually and in person at Old Town Farm in Albuquerque, November 3rd and 4th. So that's a whole lot, but if you want to find out more and kind of sort it out and register, go to regenerateconference.com to find out more. And now to our program. I'm delighted to welcome James Rebanks. He's a farmer from the Lake District of Cumbria, England. He's the author of several books. The most recent is Pastoral Song, A Farmer's Journey. He's winner of the 2021 Wainwright Prize for UK Nature Writing for the new book, Pastoral Song. Congratulations and welcome. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you for having me. It's, a, it's an honor. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to have you on this show. Now, you grew up in the 1970s and 80s in a farming family on a landscape where farmers have been living and working for many centuries. And when you were a boy, your grandfather went on a kind of a campaign to get you excited about farming. What did he do? What, what was that like for you? So, uh, yeah, so basically my granddad figured that anything apart from being a farmer was a terrible life choice. And it looked a little bit like I was too interested in watching the television when I was maybe seven or eight years old. And as, as no one in my family for 600 years has managed to not be a farmer, I think he thought it was a bad idea for me to be the first. So he took me under his wing and then he would take me around the farm. And I think he could see that me and my dad were different. And maybe my dad wasn't going to be the person that was going to get me excited by it just because like different personalities or whatever. And my granddad knew that I loved him very much. So he basically would do what a lot of farming grandparents would do. He started to take me around in the farm truck and I would open the gates and I would catch lambs with him. And he would slowly, I didn't realize I was being hustled or taught stuff, but he would tell me what was happening. He'd be like, this is why we do it this way and not that way. And 
he'd tell me stories, which seemed like they were just funny stories or wise stories, but they were nearly always about our farming values. Like, this is the way we do it, and this is the way we don't do it. And a lot of the stories were about people being super honest or avoiding being dishonest. That was clearly a really big thing to him. Like, they weren't stories about making the most possible money. They were stories about doing things right and doing things in line with our values. And like, he, he told me a story several times about when he was young, he went to a, like a, a remote valley near here to buy sheep. And there was a kind of art to that. You were meant to buy them cheap enough to make a profit, but you were not meant to buy them so cheap that you screwed the other person. And without meaning to, one year he did that. He bought them way too cheap. And then he realized he'd, he'd paid far too little for these sheep. So he went back within a few weeks to try and give the guy more money. And the other guy, of course, the other guy has ethics and says, no, we shook hands on this. Like, this is, that's my choice. And um so my granddad realized the only way to solve that was when he went next year to the same farm to pay more than they were really worth to try and level it up. And you just, th there were stories like that about what kind of people we were meant to be. And as I got older, I realized those aren't the only values in the world and that a lot of other people would say we were crazy and making the most profits the most important thing and things like that. Well, it's one of the things that's so interesting about this to me is that there was a lot that your grandfather knew and that your father knew that we are now understanding from a scientific perspective and yeah. they didn't talk about science and the way you write about them they really didn't talk much but they no. knew things and i guess this is what's so interesting to me about this these books i mean it's a visceral very vivid be also beautifully written first-hand account of traditional farming the way your grandfather did it and you know then your father was in that kind of transitional generation then the arrival of industrial agriculture in all of its power, really, and then your journey back to more traditional methods. One of the things that I think is so important to talk about, when you were young, there was a lot of wildlife around on the farm, abundant, and your family respected that, even though they weren't environmentalists. They didn't even seem to like environmentalists very much. But then a lot of that wildlife was wiped out by industrial agriculture. Explain to us the costs of that loss it's not just a, okay. it seems like it's not just a romantic or aesthetic loss no no it, it, it isn't and so this is me i'll explain this but obviously this is me explaining now not what i knew at the time but what we now know is that before humans massively changed the british landscape it was a sort of semi-wooded savanna basically there's oak woodland everywhere there's lots of clearings there's herbivores in it grazing the clearings if you go back far enough, there's things like woolly mammoths smashing the oak trees down and putting another kind of dynamism in there that would still exist in places like Africa or Alaska or something. And if you go back far enough, there's lots of beaver water meadows. We're, we're reintroducing beavers in these landscapes at the moment or starting to. And there's lots of woodland clearings and water meadows. And there's lots of thorny scrub and willowy scrub. And what we now know is that the traditional farming model emerged out of that and kept lots of it in basically. So the, the fields that my grandfather grazed pre-fossil fuel fertilizers are effectively like the woodland clearings. They have probably over 100 species of flowers and grasses in them. The thorny scrub, as, as a lot of it's disappeared, but because this is England, all of his fields are surrounded by hedgerows, which is basically like thorns that he's manipulating every 15 years into a kind of tangled hedgerow fence. Without him knowing it, that's to him, that's just a field fence, but that's actually mimicking a lot of the thorny scrub that's in the original landscape. The wetlands and things, a lot of that isn't drained that well prior to the 1960s or 70s because they don't have the big diggers to do it and they don't have the money to do it. So a lot of the wetlands are sort of semi-natural and a lot of the flat plants and flowers are thriving in that. Yeah, and there's quite a lot of woodland in these landscapes. So when I'm, I'm looking out the window and onto the farm as I talk to you and there's little patches of wood, oak woodland everywhere. So what we now know is pre-modernizing, pre-making fields bigger, pre-making it all the same kind of grazed ground, pre-using fossil fuel fertilizers and reseeding with more intensive grassland species, it's got quite a lot of what the native flora and fauna needs and wants. And in a nutshell, modern, farming modernization in this landscape, which never got completed, thankfully, <laughs> it had sort of three or four decades of trying was rip out the hedgerows or let them go old and then chop them up for firewood and then you have a bigger field. It was putting fossil fuel fertilizers on which get rid of about half of the native grasslands and flower species within about 10 years. If you could, it was plowing the field, getting rid of all of those wildflowers and just having like one species of ryegrass. 
And it was draining the wetlands because you suddenly got a more powerful digger and you could put your brother or your son or whatever on that machine and they would drain the wetland. Wherever you look, they were doing things that probably farmers had always dreamt of doing, that sort of idea of improving land. And yet they'd never been able to do it properly. Or they'd needed the natural things like the hedgerow. It took me a long, long time to realize, probably about 15 years ago, I'm 47 now, but probably about 15 years ago that the penny dropped with me that almost everything you do in this landscape to make it more industrial or more monocultural or or even more efficient, to use the word, makes it less good for nature. That's a really weird thing to realize (laughs) because then you're like, whoa, hang on a minute. So we're not trying to be hyper efficient. What are we trying to be? And I think that's where the book starts. Well, and less good for nature, but also less good for the soil. And one of the stories that was really interesting was a neighbor nearby named Henry who had never done any so-called improvement. Tell us about him. Yeah, so I'm I'm sure a lot of farmers, wherever they are uh, listening to this, would know a farmer like Henry. He was he was the old guy that had never got married, who just did things the way his dad did them, even though he was now sort of 60, 70 years old, just sort of believed in a in a previous way of doing it and would never change. And everybody liked this guy. He was a lo- really lovely, quiet, honest, decent man. But he was a sort of gentle joke as well. So when we drove past on the road, he lived next to the road. My dad would say like, wow, Henry hasn't mowed his grass yet, like a month after we had. Or wow, Henry's like putting the muck out in the way that we used to do it 40 years earlier. Or he would have all the native breeds of sheep and cattle and he would rotate them around in a very meticulous old fashioned way. And when he died, it was a real breakthrough thing for my dad. When he died, one of my dad's friends took over his land and got an agronomist to come in and do soil tests. And the soil test came back and said it was the best soil in the district. It was way better than all of the modernized intensive farming soils around it. This blew my dad's mind. Like he was in the pub when this story came out from his friend. And he came home the next morning. I can remember him. He was sort of shaken by it because he knew exactly what it meant. And he said to me, even then, I can remember him saying, like my dad would cuss a little bit, but it's like, what the hell's going on? Like, why are we doing things that make soil worse? How comes the most old fashioned, comically old fashioned farmer in the district has the best soil? And the rest of us are making it worse. There's there's something wrong. There's something wrong about this. I'm not going to pretend that my dad immediately worked out everything about regenerative agriculture overnight. He didn't, but he knew that the path we were on wasn't right. And probably like the book pastoral song that I've just written, which goes into all of that and tells that story in more detail. That's probably came from that morning, really. If I think back to one moment where that book came from, it's me seeing the look of shock on my dad's face. And actually, we weren't even, the the farmers around Henry weren't even the most modern. If you travel 20 miles down into the valley bottom, there's like a whole other speeded up, more even more intensive farmland. So, and we knew those people, they were our family friends. So you could look down the hill from the really poor hilltop where we farmed to Henry's farm a little bit down the valley. And then you could see the people basically doing a, a much more modern farming 20 miles down the hill. And we knew, we knew just from the Henry thing, those guys are probably trashing their soil worse than anybody. Yeah. And I mean, I think that seduction of putting this stuff on the field and getting this glorious dark green and being able to mow more cuttings per year and having quote unquote higher yields and all of these things. I mean, it really, it really is seductive and it takes a while to realize that it's doing harm because it also takes a while to do harm yeah that's the sort of subplot to my book really isn't it i mean i'm obviously telling stories about my dad and my granddad and very little stories about real people but you're absolutely right the time lag on this stuff is really confusing so you know i told you um about the sort of birds disappearing we had a species of birds called curlews that nest in our fields um they can live for 30 or 40 years and even if you change the mowing time, you bring it forward a month so that they can't, they can't uh, fledge their chicks anymore off the ground. They can keep coming to the same field for 30 years after you change your farming uh, before that uh, original couple die. So you see the curlews flying around over you. You're like, whoa, you know, I haven't changed anything for 10 years. Suddenly there's no curlews. And if you're a farmer, that's quite hard to understand. What you're not realizing is that the change you did 20 years ago is only now catching up with the flowers. It's only now catching up with the the birds and you're right that's confusing stuff because the time scales all over the place the causation's complicated when i talk into non-farmers i tell them things like i think if i say to most people do you want a more efficient combine harvester to get the grain off the field 
almost everybody's answer would be yes. Why would you not want a more efficient combine? But we now know in England that less efficient combines in the past left more waste grain on the stubble. And many of the, I mean, we've lost 60% of our farmland birds. It turns out that inefficient combines were allowing large numbers of birds to live through the winter on the stubbles. So it's not as simple, is it? Like the farmer thinks his job is to grow grain, the most grain and to get the most grain in the barn. The person designing the combine thinks it's their job to make it bigger and more efficient. The guy selling it or lady selling it doesn't realize it's their job. And yet things are falling off. In the real world, we live in ecosystems and things fall off the table. And that's the mind blowing bit, I think. Well, I mean, one way I under- I think about that or an analogy to that is if you eat chocolate bars, you're not going to die the next day. But over the course of, I mean, you know, for breakfast, yeah. lunch and dinner, occasional chocolate yeah. bar is fine. But these things have long term effects. That's exactly right, isn't it? You, you, smoke, you smoke cigarettes or something, you don't die tomorrow, but you do increase your chance of dying. And ultimately, you're, more, you're, you're very likely to die if you do that um, eventually. So you're quite right. I try to be really honest in the book. Like, I love my people. I love farming. I'll defend farmers all day long when they're good. But I also try to be honest about our weaknesses and our blind spots. So I think most farmers for most of history would have shaken your hands off if you offered them something that made the grass grow quicker or that is shaking your hands off if you didn't have to do something that's sort of physical and hard like like why would you not have an amazing machine that solved all of your problems for you You, everybody would want those things but i always come back to to rachel carson like i think she's been reduced to the woman that was about ddt and actually she's way cleverer than that she what she really says is it's not about ddt at all it's it's about power it's about us suddenly having power. She says in the, in the book, Silent Spring, we're the first generation in human history that just like that, we can change whole landscapes out of all recognition. And what she's basically saying is we're not clever enough. We're not clever enough to have that power. We haven't worked this stuff out yet. We don't really know what this does to insects. We don't really know what nature will do in response. And because we're, we're not angels, we're risen apes, not fallen angels, we still have to live in the world, even though we're imperfect, don't we? We still have to produce a lot of food. We still got a hell of a lot of people to feed and to worry about. We somehow have to find a way through this thing, don't we? We can't, we can't take ourselves out of nature. We're still in it. We do need to grow a lot of food. We do need to do many of the things we do, but we also have to be aware when we're trashing it, I think, and when it's, we're flipping over a line into, into damaging. You describe in almost surreal terms visiting Australia at a certain point in your life and witnessing industrial agriculture firsthand and then later visiting the American Midwest and also seeing the quite dire results of full-on industrial agriculture. But many people and probably, you know, some of our listeners, I mean, we have a lot of listeners who are in food production, but also a lot who aren't and might never have spent time on a farm, either a healthy farm or an unhealthy farm. If you had to explain to an urban person the foremost problems with industrial agriculture? What do you say? That's a good question. Uh, So the first thing I would say is I wouldn't start with the problems. I would try and explain to that person or to the person listening to this, I guess, that we're all culpable in this. So we know that something like 40, 50% of the calories that made your body and made my body probably were grown with Haber-Bosch artificial fertilizers from fossil fuels. So this guy called Fritz Haber works out how to fix nitrogen most of the calories that made you and me and everybody listening to this program or half of them came from that process. So this is deeply personal. We all benefited from it. We all benefit from cheap food. The fact that we're all carrying around thousand pound or $1,200 phones in our pockets. We've all got personal computers. We take more than one holiday a year. We've got these nice cars. We've got air conditioning. We had the money to do a lot of that stuff because we got cheaper food. So I, I would start there. But the, what's the problem? Well, we don't think there is a problem in the post-war period, do we? This is incredibly optimistic, this whole thing. We think we've beaten nature. We think we know how to keep this thing going forever. It's the best hustle we ever came up with. All of the people that came up with these technologies won Nobel Prizes. They were so respected, including Fritz Haber. But what we've started to realize since the 1960s is that the impacts on nature are horrific. So when we, when we make a field more efficient, what we've been doing since the Second World War is to make it more monocultural, make it one crop. We became way too good at killing weeds in that one crop. We got huge machinery, which likes huge fields, huge landscapes, stake fields. 
So we've taken out the patchwork of different habitats that would have existed in savannah and wilder landscapes. And yeah, we've been using some pretty nasty stuff which screws up insects and bees and all the rest of it. So it, we start with the good, we start with the optimism, and then I think you have to work through to what, what's the negative? Where did it come from? And we now know that 60% of farmland birds have disappeared. We know that in the most intensive farming landscapes on earth, the water tables are being poisoned. They were having to spend billions and billions of pounds on water treatment plants just so people in, in some of the mid Midwest cities can drink clean water because it's polluted by this stuff. We know there's dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico. And we know that there's collapses of insect life all around the world in modern intensive farming. And ultimately, we know that we can't keep winning by going to the next layer of escalation to beat nature. We've realized that this is actually a, like a one-trick pony, a sort of short-term way to win. And then actually, we've got to find our way out of using some of those technologies or to farm in ways that allow more nature in our fields. Sorry, that may not have been the, the easiest explanation ever, but that's the best I could do. Well, having more nature in the fields, as you describe, it's really important, not just because we like birds and they're beautiful, they're, it's really important for all of us and for farming itself. I, absolutely. And I mean, the, the other thing I didn't just say is we know that, that intensive industrial agriculture doesn't need many farmers. The, the irony of this is it doesn't need, it doesn't need me, it doesn't need you, it doesn't need most of the farmers in the American Midwest. It loves the idea of getting rid of them. Initially, to get it down to the bare minimum number of farmers where you do everything in a highly mechanized, massive scale way. And we're all seeing the next stage, actually, which is not to need them. Uh, create stuff in factories that you sell to people, um, sort of artificial proteins and all sorts of other gunk that is highly unhealthy. The end game is not, is not good for people. It's not good for nature. It's not good for rural communities at all. I've done enough traveling in the mid American Midwest and spoken to enough farmers in America to know that most American farmers know this. They're, many of them are trapped in this system. They know it isn't going to look after them, that it's, <laughs> it's trying to kill them off, basically. And, and what I would do is I'd, I'd also flip this and say some of the greatest farmers, I think, in the world right now are, are Americans. I'm heavily under the influence of people like Greg Judy in Missouri with his sort of long recovery grazing system with his cattle. There's so many good farmers in America that are flipping this on its head. They're going down the road of regenerative agriculture, building soil, building biodiversity, getting rid of these problematic inputs and finding ways to farm in ways that use the sort of native ecosystems and natural processes. Well, one of the things that I thought was a really important insight in your book was the reality that even the most intensive industrial model for farming needs the biodiversity that only small farms can provide. Yeah. So, so yes, for anyone who's not understanding that, um, you can have a shed like they're building in China. You can have uh, a shed with like 100,000 pigs in. Right? Just a, if it doesn't exist already, it will soon in China or somewhere like that. There are highly specialized, highly selectively bred kind of pig uh, at what they do which is converting sort of grain into meat they're incredibly efficient but they're they're also highly risky when you have a hundred thousand pigs and they're all bred exactly the same way in a highly specialized way in one building it's just a matter of time before you get diseases that can kill those pigs irish potato famine absolutely you have an overly specialized thing so even if you don't care about me, you don't care about my book, you don't care about anything called regenerative agriculture, you should care about your children eating and your grandchildren eating and the future of your family and your community. And we now know, ironically, we know that we can't keep specializing, that we actually need loads of diversity in farming, genetic diversity in crops, genetic diversity in animal species that we use and we get products from. And most of that diversity is in these little farms, particularly in marginal landscapes all around the world. So if we're going to have climate change and we need more drought resistant crops, what do the people from Bayer and Monsanto do? They go crawling over the dry lands of Africa looking for crops that are the most resistant to drought. When we're looking for pigs that could cope with more heat, for example, in a building, where do you go? You go looking for pig DNA and play, uh, for species, old fashioned species of pigs in the mountains or somewhere hot. The thing about that is we don't know what we need in the future. Like we've got a pretty good idea what we need right now, but you and I don't have a flaming clue what we need in 300 years time. So the more diversity we have in agriculture, the better, the more diversity of chicken DNA, pig DNA, that's really vital. And the intensive industrialized model of agriculture has always said it doesn't matter, which is a very, very sinister lie because they're reliant on it they can only keep their hustle going by having to to go and find this diversity and that's 
frankly, that's why Monsanto and others are trying to copyright all of the crops in the in the developing world. They're trying to they're trying to copy out, copyright the DNA of certain uh, breeds of animals. They know that the future needs that stuff, and that whoever owns it has the power and the money. One of the things, and you've been you've been talking about this already, but it it was very interesting for me to read was this kind of nuance in the fact that there's no one person or corporation or practice that you can point to and say, that's where it all went wrong. But in fact, this unsustainable system, it's kind of like, you know, death by a thousand paper cuts. I mean, lots of small decisions, many of which made sense at the time and even built on historically viable practices. So it's, it's not, you know, like no, well, all of this stuff, it's a complex yeah. system. You're quite right. When I first started to get an inkling of this, when I was maybe 15 years old, and then maybe for the following 15 years until I'm 30, I'm actually looking at it thinking, I reckon my dad must understand this. And then I realize actually my dad doesn't understand it all. He's a little bit out of his depth, just like I am. And then I'm thinking, oh, maybe the guys down the road, the modern farmers, they've got their heads around this. And then I talk to them like, no, nah, I don't think they have. I sort of years went by and... Uh, 15, 20 years went by, and then I suddenly realized that the confusion I had as a 15-year-old is actually a really healthy, honest confusion because nobody's thought this through properly. And that's that's the really shocking thing. The, the guys at John Deere haven't thought it through when they design the machines. The economists who tell us that efficiency is everything haven't thought it all through. Yeah, you have the irony there, don't you, that some 15-year-old kid in a field is is realized that this is like the emperor's new clothes. It's um, <laughs> it's good until you start to question it, and then it all disappears and that's that's amazing to me really that's what the books are that's what the book's about it's about that 15 year old working this through and going oh wow oh wow nobody's thought this through properly we're in big trouble (laughs) yeah and it's also interesting the cultural shifts that you're seeing i mean you've got conservative farmers conservative with a small c who historically really haven't liked environmentalists very much as as we start to talk about and then one day a woman named Lucy shows up on your farm and basically says something along the lines of I'm from the government and I'm here to help you which nobody ever believes it was actually kind of a charity but you know to protect rivers then you and your father actually worked with her to fence off the stream banks yeah. or river banks and it seemed yeah. like that was a kind of turning point moment where you started to see that there were really common interest between environmentalism and agriculture yeah absolutely so there's there's a number of things happening there if i'm really honest so my dad's my dad's quite old-fashioned gentlemanly and this young woman turns up and if it's if it'd been a middle-aged guy it'd probably have been rude to him but because it was a young lady he sort of sits down and gives this young, young woman time and and then there's some a, a lot of skill and uh, charm on lucy's part she said look i'm going to talk you through this and you might not like what i have to say but i'm going to tell you what's wrong with the rivers here and how it got wrong and what I'd like to persuade you to do. And then there's a third part, which is a horrible self-interest. We were broke at the time and I was trying to move to the farm and re-fence it and do all sorts of stuff. And she had money. And the truth is she had money and she was willing to help us with some of the fencing to restore the fields and things. But with a caveat, she said, look, I'm not going to just pay for your fences so you can do whatever you want. But if you work with me on the rivers, and you work with me on some woodland, you work with me on the habitats I want to put back here, I'll help you. Like, can we find some middle ground here? And to my surprise, I think we'd been stumbling towards wanting to do more for some years before that. And then she came at the right time. But I, I worked with Lucy maybe for a month where I like, exchanged the emails. I went to see her a couple of times. We walked around the fields. She was really respectful of what we were and what we believed. But we came up with a plan. We didn't do everything she wanted to do. She had quite a radical plan for in the floodplain. She wanted to move a river. I've since done that, but I wouldn't do that when she first asked. I went to see my dad, actually. My dad had cancer at the time. He was dying. And I, I thought maybe my dad wouldn't approve. And that, that mattered to me. It's, and actually, when I said to him, I showed him this plan. And he said, just do it. I said, yeah, but I thought you wouldn't like this. And he said, is she going to help you to pay for that fencing? And she's going to help you get on the farm. She's going to help you have a future and pay for some of the things you can't afford. Get on with it. And and then like months later, when we fenced off some of the riparian areas and created some small wetlands and things, but immediately we could tell there's more birds and there's species of birds like barn owls, these white owls that we have. Uh, they came back within a few months just because there's longer grass, there's voles. And it was so quick. In fact, every time we've ever created a new habitat on the farm, within days or weeks, 
this cool stuff comes in and you're like, wow. This isn't like years and years until things get better. Within days, stuff turns up. Like we had, we built some ponds two years ago and within a week, there was three little white birds on them, three little egrets. No one in this valley's ever seen a little egret that I know of. And that, my mind's blown. I'm ringing up my friend who's a bird watcher and I'm like, where did the egrets come from and how did they know? And he was saying that a lot of birds are flying over farmland all the time. And they're looking down and they're not seeing what they need. Like it was once there, it's not there anymore. The minute you create it, like it's the old thing, build it and they'll come. Things, things are falling out of the sky on our farm just because we created a little habitat. And to me, I'm my dad in his last few months. And to the, particularly to my kids, that's kind of intoxicating because we, we didn't like being the bad guys. You know, you turn the TV on and you're a farmer and everything's farmer's faults and you've ruined this, you've ruined that. We hated that. Um, I think we hated it particularly because it, it was sometimes true. And this is different. This is like putting things back together. This is looking after land properly. Yeah. And we, we were losing money when we farmed conventionally. Now we make a profit. It's a modest profit. It's not a huge profit. So I, I think this is the best way to keep my family on this piece of land. And that's always been the number one objective. Can I like keep hold of this piece of land that my grandfather, my dad looked after? And then could I pass it on to my kids? I mean, they, they may say, no, thank you, but I, I want to pass it on and I want to pass it on in good condition so that they judge me fairly. Another cultural shift that I thought was interesting and important to talk about was the dwindling of farm labor. There was a time a couple of generations ago where there were laborers who were really knowledgeable, really specialized. I mean, probably a kind of knowledge that would put many academic agronomists to shame in some ways. <laughs> But then they disappeared. What happened? So they, they disappear um, for a bunch of reasons. One of the reasons is, is the machinery. So the machinery means that you can cover vast amounts of area, land, do the job that used to take several people to do it. There's probably some cultural shift in there as well, as people want a slightly more, a more urban lifestyle and the leisure and things that come with it. And those old jobs didn't necessarily give those people that. Yeah, they were, they were amazing people. And like I read a lot of American farming books and like the, the big dirty secret with agriculture in developed countries, but particularly in America is, is now how badly it treats workers, right? Like Im immigrant workers pays them terribly, treats them, you know, and they work in terrible conditions. They don't have proper pay. I, I find that really sad and I find it problematic. And when I look at the great regenerative farmers, one of their objectives often is not just for their own family to live and work on the land again and to, uh, to handle the soil, to work with animals or whatever it might be, but to get more people back on their land. And I actually believe in, okay, this is optimistic, but I believe in a kind of renaissance of the landscape where I live. Not only keeping the farm in my family and doing things that are in our self-interest because we care about it, but making it a better place for other people to come and visit. Like loads of people come to our farm all the time. We have school visits to the farm. We have people coming to learn or volunteer or plant trees or whatever. And I love that. I didn't used to when I was young. I used to try and keep people off the farm, but now, now we've flipped it on its head. We're like, no, come on in. And if you don't like what, if you don't like something we do, tell me about it. Come and talk about it. I think farmers are way too defensive on like social media and on, we're always reacting to some crazy extreme idea from some lunatics. Just ditch that. Let's start talking about what we believe, what we want to see about our progressive ideas for looking after our land, but also putting that together our communities. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's, it's funny. And again, I've, as you can probably tell, I think in analogies a lot. And I, one day I was thinking about the, the analogy between the loss of this community of laborers and specialized people who knew what they're doing, between that and the loss of soil microbes, soil microbial communities, you know, so you've got these communities in the soil, in healthy soil, where that are full of little messengers and workers and people transporting minerals and all the things that, you know, this microscopic or small scale life does. And then in human communities, you've got people who know how to do, whether it's, you know, shoeing horses or, or repairing tractors. Now you're not even allowed to repair tractors in some places, you know, there's this yeah. old right to repair movement. And a lot of that labor has been sort of sucked up into this monoculture of Walmart and the yeah. equivalent and all of that. So it's, it's just like, the homogenization seems to be taking place at every level. Yeah. And also some of the stuff we were brought up to believe is just wrong. Like, and it was largely American, but I don't mean that in an anti-American way. The sort of post-war sort of American consumerist dream is that urban's better than rural, wealthy's better than poor, 
Uh, de-skilling labor is a good thing because it makes stuff cheaper. But those, all of those things are deeply problematic. Like if you stand in a tower block in the middle of a British or American city and like look out the window, you're, you're seriously going to tell me that's, that's the end point of human civilization that we should all aspire to? No, no. I think being in nature is probably one of the best places to put humans. Likewise, we divorced and disconnected ourselves from food and food production. Really? That's, that's an unqualified good thing? I, I don't believe that for one second. That, that's not a good idea. I think even in cities, the more people who are connected to food and farming and, and, and horticulture and all the rest of it, that makes life better. Like literally, what, what, what better things have humans got to do than sit with their loved ones and eat good food and drink good wine or beer or whatever it is and spend time together? Or and what better thing is there for a human to do than to produce the food to be able to do that? So they're part of that whole process, surrounded by birds or insects or whatever it might be. We've been sold an absolute kipper. It's, <laughs> it's not right. It's just, it's just fundamentally wrong. And I think most people want to be surrounded by nature. I think most people want to have some kind of relationship with the land that feeds them. I think most people want to eat good, healthy, real food. We've just made it really hard for people to do that. So I, I think... Every now and then people have to come along and kick the apple cart over. And that's <laughs> Rachel Carson started that, I think, with intensive agriculture. And people like Wendell Berry also did that, who's one of my heroes in America. And there's a, a lot of fantastic farmers and food people at the moment who are just going, whoa, enough of this story because it's not a good one. Let's flip it. Let's talk about what really makes life good and try and make that happen for as many people as possible. And it's tricky too, because, I mean, the first section of your book is called Nostalgia, but the picture it paints of farming and shepherding is not so romantic. I mean, it's rough work. It's cold in the winter. Your hands are like leather. You get cut. It's physically taxing. It's all hours of the day. And there's a lot of emotional pain to it with your animals dying. I mean, it's not, you know, I can see why people left the land. So so can I. Although, so, so that's true, isn't it? Let's be honest. I think there has to be choice in this thing. There wasn't choice in the deep, dark past. People just had to do these lives. I don't want people that don't want to do it to do it. But I think the truth is there's a great many people who do want to do it. And the other thing that I've seen, and I find this really interesting because in, in recent years, I've been able to go and look at some farming in uh, various places in Africa. I've been to some of the most, and I use inverted commas, backwards agricultural uh, countries in Europe, like Romania, when you go to those places, do you find people that are deeply miserable about living in rural areas and working in fields on hillsides? No, that's not what you find. In fact, I've worked on a Romanian hillside with a load of shepherds when they were mowing the grass with, by hand with a scythe. Now, I've spent most of my life thinking that was probably brutal, awful work. But the afternoon that I spent with them was one of the most fun afternoons I've ever had in my life. You forget, I think we forget that people could do that. We're all going to the gym and paying a fortune to go to a gym. We could actually be doing something useful with our, with our energy. Right. When you work together and do work like that, there's a sense of community. There's talk, there's songs, people having fun and all the rest of it. Now, I'm not saying we should mow all grass with a scythe, but when I actually did it, I got a shock that it wasn't actually all bad. I think in a way we've been, we, we've been sold the myth of easy, really, that everything should be easier. Nothing should be hard work. And I'm not sure that's true. When you look at a lot of the great regenerative farms now, people like Richard Perkins in Sweden and what have you, that's hard work. It's like super knowledgeable, super intense, lots of judgment, lots of using of hands, but it can be done. Humans can do it. And a lot of people want to. I want to. I don't, I don't want to escape the life I do on the farm. Even on the wet, wet days, I sometimes want to go inside and have a cup of coffee, but I never want to es escape my life. And so that brings us to the problem and the kind of global situation as it exists right now, which is that if you were a traditional farmer, as you are doing healthy soil practices, caring for watersheds and wildlife, and basically doing sustainable and regenerative agriculture, the place we are now is that the real price of food, and especially the share that goes to the farmer, has declined precipitously since your grandfather's generation. And so it's yeah. difficult or impossible for a farmer like you to earn a living without doing work off the farm in yep. that other system. Yep. And at the same time, it's also the case that real wages have stagnated, which means they've, in real terms, they've gone way down, as has the price of food. So we're in this crazy situation where people at the lower end of the economic spectrum 
rely on very low prices of food from very unsustainable practices in yeah. order to eat. And so finding our way out of that, like what's, is it policy other, like how do you see the way forward? So um, it's easier, to, if I'm honest, it's easier to see the way forward on this side of the Atlantic than maybe on yours, where I, I think there's a slightly different culture in a lot of the European countries about why this matters, if I'm honest. So do I have all the answers for America? Probably not. I don't know enough, really. In Britain, I know what the answers look like or I have a fair idea. I think some of it has to come from the top. So I think some of it's about trade policy. So even though I got loads of American farmer friends and Australian farmer friends, would I personally sign a free trade deal with them uh, so they can bring things in beneath our cost of production that are produced in ways we don't agree with? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that. I would. I, some of it has to be about policy and politics. Like Norway, Norway basically won't let you import anything at a cheaper price than their farmers produce it. And then they highly regulate at the local and national level exactly how what you can and can't do on your land. Now, a lot of American farmers would hear that and freak out and think it was communism, but I actually think it works quite well if you go and have a look at it. There's a lot of good in that. I think we need a cultural shift, don't we, about the importance of food and farming. We've let everybody get very disconnected from it, and, and now we're being preyed on by all these other crazy ideas about fake food and fake proteins and all that crap. So I think there's a lot of work for people like myself that write books or people like yourself that are educating people or getting the message out there. There's a huge amount of work to be done to, to educate people, I think. And then there's obviously, we're all, as well as many other things, we are all consumers. We all go to shops every week and restaurants and cafes and things. I think we're going to start being way more troublesome. Like I think Wendell Berry said, we're the most thoughtless eaters in human history. And we, we've been encouraged to be thoughtless eaters and thoughtless shoppers. That's what they want us to be. And I think we have to start being problematic and like asking the waiter or waitress, where's the meat from? If you can't tell me where the meat's from, I'm not eating it. Like, sorry, I'll come back next week if you get the meat from a source that I can trust. Or we can make choices like having a, being part of a CSA or like getting a home delivery of vegetables from like a local producer. We do that. There's so much we can do. And yeah, and, and at the farming end of the scale, I know it's super difficult. And I know lots of farmers are trapped, but I think we have to start standing up as well. We have to start being more problematic. Like, I don't let any traveling salesmen come in my yard anymore. They used to come like two or three times a week to sell me things like sell me feed, sell me fertilizer. You know, no offense to those people, but they, they don't come on my farm anymore. I don't need what they sell. We, we've got to start standing up, I think. Like, when did we become so powerless? When did we lose all our agency and our voice? I think we need to speak back to the system. We need to stop it helping these people to mug us. We, we need to fight back against it and be heard and talk to our own communities. In, in the community where I live, we're trying to get more and more people onto the farms because what we've realized is that, and okay, we live in a, an affluent area in an area of the north that's very beautiful. So that isn't typical of everywhere. But if you've got a landscape full of people that can afford better food, who say they love this place, who love this landscape, why would I not have those people part of the conversation with me? Why would I not show them how I farm? Why would I not talk to them about eating my meat instead of supermarket meat from some horrible shed or something? So I think it's that whole swathe of things, isn't it? Starting with big politics and trade deals, right down to our individual decisions as shoppers and consumers and farmers. Do I think that's all going to get sorted out tomorrow? No, I don't. Um, but I actually, in the long run, think we'll sort this out. I do think we'll sort this out because we can't keep doing the wrong thing forever because there won't be any soil left or the soil will be so dead or we'll all be broke. I think there's a rebellion brewing and it, I think it's brewing everywhere. I have to say, I mean, I've been doing this show for several years and last year I thought, now, wait a minute, how am I eating? And so I joined a CSA and I mean, it's, you know, the we were talking before about you do bad things to your body or to your soil and it takes a while to see the damage it also takes a while when you start eating well to see the the positive mm -hmm. benefits but after a few months i started thinking i'm happier <laughs> like i'm literally <laughs> like mentally happier and i i think i know it was the food i'm i'm, sh I'm sure as we, we've started eating basically only eat our own meat now like we have um sheep pigs cows we have enough nice meat and that meat's amazing. And like just every now and then occasionally I'll be with a friend and I'll eat some meat somewhere else. It's not the same. It's really, really not the same. And, yeah. and I don't feel right after I've eaten that food. Whereas when I eat really good food, like you're saying, whether it's vegetables or meat or whatever, I feel right. And the absolute worst thing, the worst thing to eat, and I'm trying to eat almost none of it now, is 
when we're eating this sort of processed stuff where we don't know what all those things are on the ingredients box, that stuff makes you feel rubbish, like really rubbish. Yep. And also, if we take a step back, like you're talking about being in a CSA, sometimes it's a pain, right? It's like the difference between being a teen, like a young teenager or an adult. Being a teenager is a lot of fun because you just do whatever you want to do and you don't care about the long term impact of things. Um, or sometimes you don't. Being in a CSA or getting a veg box scheme or eating properly is a bit more like being an adult, isn't it? There's a million things to worry about. It's a bit of hassle. You don't want to eat beans and they send you with lots of beans or uh, kale or whatever it might be. It's harder work. But I, I think ultimately it's better, it's better for us, isn't it? And we don't really have, even though we often want to, I'm not sure we really have the right to opt out of being grown ups. Or, or doing things that's a little bit more complicated. <laughs> I think we have to make ourselves do some of those things. Well, I have to say, I love going to my CSA because the woman who's the farmer is so nice and she writes these beautiful emails about what each food is and I learn about what each like vegetable is. I have, I'm embarrassed to say, I've cooked vegetables that I didn't even know what they were. Like I'd never heard of them or, <laughs> you know, but anyway, but so the other thing I want to talk to you about is you live in a place, I mean, I'm here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, in northern New Mexico. You live in a place, the north of England, which has for many, many years been romanticized by people who aren't from there, people who don't live and work there. At Poets and Artists, you talk about Wordsworth, people who are charmed by the place, and then they show up, and then they drive up the price of land, and then they don't accept the way things are done. They don't want cows walking across places that they think should be all neat and clean. Same thing here in northern New Mexico. It's it's kind of almost uncanny. How do you handle and how can communities handle that set of issues, do you think? So, and this is, I think it's a good example of my, my community not being perfect, right? So if we try to be honest about our flaws, my community's reaction to lots of people moving in was to turn their backs on them, really. Not, not in a totally nasty way, but they're different. They don't do things like we do. We'll just like hold to our own people. We'll do our own thing. And we'll get mad at them. When they do crazy stuff, we'll just get mad at them. That was our first, our first stab at it. And I think it lasted for the early part of my life. Like let their dogs run free. Yeah, they let the dogs run free. Like you say, they've bought the house we wish our friend had bought and all the rest of it. There's all sorts of reasons you can find to resent other people. I'd have to say that's not, we didn't play that right. In the last 10 years, I've learned something else, which is when, like when we do tree planting on the farm now, we send an email around everyone in the valley and we say, look, if anyone wants to come on Sunday, plant trees, come down. All of these people that I used to want to dislike are now standing in the rain with me planting trees and it turns out that they're not quite what I thought they were. They're nice people and they, their kids are doctors or nurses helping people in COVID and they know amazing stuff that I don't know. They'll start telling me about trees or soil biology or they've had an interesting other life. So I think the engaging with one another and getting over yourself is probably the way to deal with that as much as possible. And now I share, like a lot of those people follow me on social media. So I'll, I'll be like explaining what I'm doing on the farm all the time and they're following and then they'll stop and talk to me on the road and they're like, oh, I love what you're doing with the meadows at the moment. I, I didn't understand what it was, but now I know. And so, yeah, it, it, when, we're not saints, but I, I think it's all about being a bit bigger than we are, isn't it? It's all about just taking a deep breath and going, all right, what's, what's the bigger way of doing this? Like, how could I help those people to be nice to me? And occasionally we do fundraising, like crowdfunders for, for like environmental projects that maybe are never going to pay me back. Some of those people are just like ring me up and go, look, I'd like to put a thousand pounds into planting like this little wood. And you're like, wow, you want to spend your money to plant this woodland. Uh, those people are amazing. I, th I think, I think we, we, we all did each other a disservice when we were just suspicious and grumpy. When I was reading your books, I felt like I got to know you and your father and your grandfather I barely knew that you had a mother or a grandmother. You me barely mentioned your wife. And it seems like, I mean, part of the traditionalism that you're in is it's really a man's world. And women, you know, you there's a moment where you say, you know, I couldn't do any of this if my wife weren't taking care of the kids and cooking and keeping the household and all of that. And these are traditional roles. Does traditional farming of the kind that you do require that kind of separation of men's and women's roles or do you see this evolving i mean no judgment i'm just i'm just curious yeah yeah yeah. no no so, so that so that's fine so um 
I'm not sure that's the full truth, but I, I, res I respect you taking it. So in the first book, I, I also tell you about a lot of the best shepherds here were women, always, like not, not yeah, since the Jean... 1960s. Yeah, Jean Wilson, my next door neighbor. So yeah. there's, there is a long tradition here of the men going off to earn money doing other stuff in the mines or whatever. So they probably think they're their primary breadwinner. But the thing of cultural status here is the shepherding. And that was often done by the wife who doesn't go to the mine or doesn't go to work on the roads or the railways. So there's a very long tradition of these amazing women that are super tough, super independent, can do everything the men can do in high heels backwards, to quote Ginger Rogers. <laughs> so yeah, there was that tradition. And I was writing quite a male book, really. I was, I was trying to write about how I became me and where that came from. And that, that, that was quite a male story in my family. But there's an, un, an untold bit of this. I'm probably not supposed to be telling you this, but my wife is an amazing writer and my wife will write that story. And I felt when I looked at it that that wasn't my story to tell anyway. So I gave glimpses of my mom and my grandmother. But um, I hope that in the years, next couple of years, there'll be another book that sits alongside it, which is my wife telling that more female story through her eyes and in her voice about what she believes and knows. And... I'm super excited about that because I feel like it will complement what I've done very nicely, I think. And and the truth is, like, my wife wanted to look after the kids and, and, and loves cooking and sort of domestic things. But that's not the all of her. It's, it's not the all of anybody. So um, it's been a really exciting time in our family for the kids to get a little bit older and for my wife to then have time to do the things that she's brilliant at after basically sacrificing herself for the kids and me for quite a long time. And the next stage of our life is is me trying to, support that really and, and support my wife so that she gets a moment and tells her story. And I'm so excited about it. I think you'll probably love that book as well. Well, let's get her on the show when the time comes. She would love that. She's amazing. She's, um, she's super modest. She doesn't think she's amazing, but I think, I think the book will be great. The last thing I wanted to talk to you about was we talk about the idea of the commons and all of our problems of water and wildlife and land use and food, these problems can't be solved unless on some level we embrace the fact that we really hold a lot of things in common. You can't just divide everything up into squares and have them be privately owned and and have a functional landscape and a food system. And I was struck, I think it was in your first book, of your really embracing the word commoner, you know, like connecting the commons with being a commoner. That's a word that often has had a derogatory connotation. And I started to think about you and your community as indigenous farmers, the way we have indigenous Native American farmers, native agriculture here in New Mexico. And it took me a few minutes to kind of figure that out because you're from England and you think about the British Empire, you don't think about indigeneity exactly. But I'd love yeah. to hear your thoughts about that sense of belonging to the land and the commons and really being indigenous. Yeah, no, I think that's true. Isn't it? And I think, I, th I think if I'm honest, we're all a little bit nervous about those words, right? As uh, particularly if you're if you're white, you're nervous about claiming any kind of indigenous status because you think surely that's people that look different to me in all sorts of places around the world. But I think there's a lot of truth in what you just said. So it looks like my people have been here for a thousand years. Maybe they were here for lots of thousands of years. There isn't, to the best of our knowledge, any people before them. So I, I guess we are, to an, you know, unless somebody tells me I'm wrong, I think we are the indigenous people of here, certainly since the last ice age. And yeah, I find, I find it amazing, actually. And when I, was, when I was on a sort of journey of reading and trying to understand who we were and why we're like what we are, I actually love, I, I love two kinds of literature, actually. I love writers who are indigenous. So like whether they're Australian Aboriginal people or like first people in, in North America, I think there is something very similar. There's a shared sort of sense of place and a sort of sense of the individual and the short term not really mattering. Because like, if we're honest, the sort of post-war American or British popular culture is, is all about the individual, isn't it? It's all about individual happiness, individual consumption, individual self-realization. On one level, I wasn't brought up to think like that. I, when we're talking at the start of the conversation about my grandfather making me a farmer, on one level, my granddad doesn't really care what I want. And you could say, well, that's a terrible way to think about a child, but he's got a different mindset, which is, this is what we do. We've always done it. This is a good way to live. Our individual wants and needs are quite small relative to this bigger thing, which is the going on of our culture and our landscape. And it won't be that bad, really. So I'm going to get this kid to understand what's good about it. And if you hadn't wanted to, if you didn't take to it, you wouldn't have taken to it. 
No, although I think he'd have just kept going until I did. <laughs> but you're right. What, what really happened, and I find this interesting, is if you just ask me straight out as a seven-year-old, do you want to be a farmer? Yes or no? It's for all time. I'd probably say no. But actually, three or four years after following my grandfather around and really getting under the skin of the thing and taking part in the thing and realizing what it was and how rich it was and how interesting it was, Three or four years later, I give a completely different answer. I, like there's nothing else on earth I want to do more than that. So I think that maybe there's a lesson in there for all of us, isn't there, about what we think we want or what we think we need is based on what we know right now, isn't it? It isn't necessarily based on really understanding things, really being part of things. So maybe we all need to put ourselves in those places where we learn more and um, engage with this stuff more just to see where it takes us. James Rebanks is a farmer from the Lake District of Cumbria, England, and his latest book is Pastoral Song, A Farmer's Journey, one of my favorite books that I've read about farming ever. Thank you so much for being with us on Down to Earth. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. This program is produced in collaboration with the Kivira Coalition, a non-for-profit educational organization and community network of ranchers, farmers, conservationists, scientists, educators, and many others dedicated to the resilience of arid working lands. Their work aims to shift current practices of agriculture and land stewardship to those that produce good food, support meaningful livelihoods in rural places, sustain biodiversity, and remedy the impacts of climate change. To learn more about Kivira and how you can support their work, visit kiviracoalition.org, Q-U-I-V-I-R-A, coalition.org. You've been listening to Down to Earth, a production of the Kivira Coalition and the Radio Cafe. I'm your host, Mary Charlotte Domondi. If you like this program, please share it with your network. And we'd love your feedback. Go to downtoearth.media, where you can contact us and you can sign up for the mailing list. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. We're producing this show bi-weekly and would love your comments and ideas. So once again, downtoearth.media. And check out the Kivira Coalition, kiviracoalition.org. That's Q-U-I-V-I-R-A. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.